Okay, we are moving back to Nevada. And uh, next up, we have Paramount Gold, uh, New York Stock Exchange listed, PZG. Um, advancing a few properties in the area. And uh, here to give us an update is Rachel Goldman, President and CEO. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. I haven't even said anything yet, but thank you, Misha. Thank you, Jessica. And thank you to the Kraft family for providing this opportunity for us to speak to you. Okay. I'm lowering it from Wes's very high level. Okay, better? Um, just one point of clarification, I am CEO and director. Our president and COO, Glenn Van Trek, is our technical guru. By way of background, I joined Paramount in February of 2020, just at the outset of COVID. I actually have a capital markets background. I am not technical. I'm letting you know. <laughs> but uh, we do have very good technical bench strength, both on the board and with Glenn, who's our CEO based in Santiago, who manages all aspects of our technical activities. Now, since this is a uh, more generalist conference, I am also doing something that I don't normally do, which is talking about why gold a little bit. And for those of us who are already well entrenched in the gold industry, and you know, these charts will just serve as great reminders of why we continue to do what we're doing. And these actually are courtesy of Dr. Martin Murenveld, who some of you might be familiar with. He's a former colleague of mine. Um, he's an economist who's been actually following the gold industry specifically for decades, so has tremendous data sets of really good information going back for a long time, which I think helps to put things in perspective because certainly what we're seeing in the gold market is a bit of a battle between the short-term and the long-term factors that influence the price movement, which I'll get to. Now, the equities are something different, which we'll also come to, but the interesting points, I think, to note I mean, we talk a lot about record prices in gold. So, you know, the blue line here is the nominal price of gold. And yes, we did see a record in, in August of uh, 2020. But really, if you look back over time, and this is going back 50 years, the peak in the gold price adjusted for today's dollars would have been in, in January of 1980, um, where there was a, a PM fix of 850, which would correspond to over $3,000 in today's dollars. So <clears throat> although we've seen this great move in the gold price recently, it's really catching up in a sense to this has been a you know over 20 year bull market in gold, even though it doesn't feel like it for a lot of us in the industry. We did have a bit of a setback period in 2012 to 2016 while the Fed was tightening. But certainly, you know, we're we're fully off to the races here again. And the reasons for it are, I think. A lot of it is being driven by what these long-term factors are. So central banks are increasing their investments. There's a theme of de-dollarization going on. There is the global debt scenario. These are all things that will drive long-term demand in gold, and we're seeing it come through. What happens day to day, and which causes us angst in the junior space, particularly as we all need capital on an ongoing basis, is that the gold price in the short term reacts more to short-term concerns about what's the Fed going to do next? When are they going to pivot? When are they going to stop? Um, and, and, and anticipation in and around that, which the gold market is not exempt from the trading type influences that we've seen take over other markets, namely anything related to the algos or high frequency trading. So that's what we see in the short term. But gold, if you look in terms of the demand, where it comes from, it comes from, again, very different things than what you see trading on a daily basis. So 46% goes into jewelry. 50% of that jewelry demand, as somebody alluded to earlier, comes from India and China. And both of these are recovering really in a strong fashion. Um, central bank, 17% of demand. And that is definitely growing. I mean, obviously, the thing with gold, which is different from other commodities, is basically everything that's ever been mined is still around. We don't use it up the way we use other commodities. So it's trading hands. So it's really, it's more in the, in the mm, long term, I would say, more of a, uh, demand-driven uh, dynamic that's going to drive the price. We do also have the constraints of supply constraints that we've had a number of our speakers talk to already, the declining reserve and production profiles of the major mining companies, and that we can talk a little bit about why that is and how that's impacted valuations. But bottom line is, as more demand starts to come in, and we haven't even really seen the ETF um, start buying yet, there will be that fundamental um, growth in, in demand. 
So this is just to, to look at the central bank net gold demand. We've seen a clear trend from the early 2000s that is partly as a result of de-dollarization. You might see some of this play through with the increased sanctions around the world. Um, countries who are now starting to trade directly in currencies other than U.S. dollar and bypassing. But the central banks, I mean, they are long-term buyers. They're not trading one day to the next, like what we see in the, in the gold market on a daily basis. And then this just shows official gold reserves clearly rising for the central bank and um, gold as a percentage of total reserves also benefiting from that trend of, you know, dollar reserves down, gold reserves up. And as I mentioned, the ETFs, who are a significant part of, of gold demand, you haven't seen them show up yet. I mean, they were net sellers in um, the last two years. I apologize, these numbers got a little bit skewed down here, but this is basically a 20-year chart. And year to date, they're still sellers in 2023. So as this starts to pick up, I mean, again, you're going to see another uh, critical component for what's going to drive gold demand going forward. And just as we talk about gold as a unit of money, this is a great chart because back in 1971, you could buy a Corvette for $5,400 US, which today would cost you $70,000. But in units of gold, it would have cost you 135 ounces in 1971, and today it will cost you 39. So this isn't just a gold story. This, again, is a US dollar story, and that's what explains this dynamic. So what does this mean for the equities? And again, I do come from a capital markets background, so I do like to link everything back to what we're doing there. Um, gold stocks are cheap. I mean, we've been hearing this from a number, a number of our speakers. We heard it yesterday from Nikki and Brent. This I thought was a great stat that BMO, uh, Bank of Montreal, who's one of the largest um, bankers for mining companies globally, they have 50 global gold companies under coverage with an aggregate market cap of $288 billion. This compares to household names like Exxon, $475 billion, Disney, $187, Apple, $2.6 trillion. Basically, if you're wondering whether this is a crowded trade in the equities, it absolutely isn't, because nobody is showing up yet to buy these stocks. And this is why there's a tremendous opportunity today. Not just that, but when we went through that period of Fed tightening, this also coincided where a lot of the big gold companies had kind of blown themselves up with overpriced acquisitions. They've since, in a lot of ways, found religion. You've seen these companies completely um, restructure themselves. They're generating earnings. They are generating free cash flow. They're paying dividends. This was unheard of 10 and 20 years ago, in a sense. And yet, they're trading at very inexpensive valuations, all things considered. And as you move down the market cap chain into the developer space where Paramount lives, Valuations have gotten really cheap. And so below in this table are traditional kind of resource ways of valuing companies, uh, price to nav, producers even trading sub one time, developers half nav, Paramount sitting here at point two. There's reasons for all of this. Part of it is stage of development. And as we get into the Paramount story, I have to explain to you why we're as cheap as we are and where I see the opportunity for us to start to close that valuation gap moving forward. So who is Paramount Gold? Um, this is actually Paramount 2, if you will. The first company, Paramount Gold and Silver, had been acquired by Core Mining in 2015, and at that time spun out Paramount Gold Nevada. We're named such because we own the big sleeper property in Nevada. But in 2016, uh, we acquired the Grassy Mountain Project in Eastern Oregon. The reason that became the focal project for the company is at that time, the gold price didn't um, create an economic scenario for Sleeper, which is a fast producing asset, it's low grade, it's a very large asset, but in a 1250 gold price environment, it didn't work. So <clears throat> we are a US domiciled company, and as Misha mentioned, we're listed on the NYC American Stock Exchange. All of our assets are in the US. The only thing not US about us is some of our management and board that were spread out geographically. So the assets are in, in Oregon and Nevada, this is our cash as of December 31st. We have some significant shareholders in here that I'd like to give a shout out to. Seabridge Gold has been a very supportive shareholder. In fact, Rudy Franck, the founder and CEO of Seabridge, is the one who recruited me to join Paramount. Um, and they've been very supportive. They're well represented on our board. Osenko led our 
two feasibility studies on grassy and uh, they elected to take stock instead of cash for the work that they did. And then we have some larger um, participation from some institutions in Canada and in the US. So recently, as we all talk about the challenges of, of financing um, in this space, um, we're no strangers to this either. We uh, secured a term sheet with Sprott Royalty for 10 to $15 million. It's a royalty convertible note. The rationale here was that Sprott, of all the royalty companies that we've engaged with thus far, were a little bit more nimble, a little bit more flexible, willing to take on some of the permitting risk with us that we're going through in Oregon. And they were willing to advance funds at a sooner stage than most anybody else. So this is structured to reduce the, the equity dilution within the company. And it's structured so that once we get uh, an upcoming permitting milestone from the state of Oregon, we'll have access to those funds, which should see us through to permits. So a little bit about Grassy Mountain as our key project here. We are located in Eastern Oregon. So we're all the way on the border with Boise as well, with Idaho, we fly into Boise to access the project. The access road here that you'll see probably looks very similar to a project that you visit in Nevada. It's very similar type topography, um, desert, sagebrush, sage grouse, and the like. And the aerial here really was just designed to show that there isn't really much around us. So we've had a lot of um, support at the county, state level to see this project move forward because we're located in a very impoverished part of the state that could really use the jobs. We'll create about 300 construction jobs and then about 100 full-time jobs once we're up and running. And those 100 jobs will pay close to double what the median average is for our part of the state in Mallard County. So needless to say, they'd love to see this move forward. So the last feasibility study that we completed was just this past September. As a U.S. listed company, we have to comply with these SK-1300 rules from the SEC. So that was the reason why we did a second feasibility study in two years. Otherwise, probably wouldn't have spent money on that. However, it did give us the opportunity to address the inflation questions that come up all the time after the last two hyperinflationary years. So the good news for us is that the project still stands up nicely. Um, so in, in spite of the fact that we have a total of a million ounces outlined at Brassy, we're really only targeting the small high-grade core, just under 400,000 ounces of 620 grams per ton. It's going to be a really small footprint underground mine, um, 750 ton a day milling operation, CIL recovery. There had been a gravity circuit included in the, in the pre-feasibility study, which we were able to drop, save a couple million dollars, and didn't sacrifice anything on the recoveries. We'll produce on average about 50,000 ounces of gold equivalent annually. And CapEx, again, adjusting for the last two years of inflation. And this assumes all new equipment. As we know, when you actually go into, into construction, you can bring in used equipment and so on. You probably see some of these numbers uh, adjust as you go forward. But that 136 million is, is fully baked, I'd say, including contingencies and all that. And the initial mine life of eight years, there are a number of opportunities for mine life extension that we haven't identified fully yet to bring them into a mine plan, but I hope to show you where those opportunities exist. And importantly for us, I mean, we'll generate after-tax annual free cash flow of about 20 million based on our 1750 base case study, you know, which is higher than our current market cap, I will point out. Um, so just based on the, on the uh, post-tax economics here, I did include um, a current case of 1900, and I guess an upside, so we're probably somewhere between those two right now. Uh, but the project generates, you know, strong returns and certainly a, a quicker payback and a higher NTV, higher the cold price goes. And happily for us, too, from a planning standpoint, we break even at about twelve fifty uh, per ounce. So that does give a lot of comfort as we move this forward. I like this picture of Rassi, the deposit, because it shows a couple of things. Number one, um, the low-grade mineralization, which is kind of in the purple color, is about 50 meters from surface. And then the high grade mine that we're building is really in the hot pink. So where it says greater than three grams, so it's a 6.5, 6.8 gram average. It, it does start to explain why previous owners looked at this as a good open pit target um, with that low grade mineralization and then you know getting into further into depth further down would be, but certainly could be an economic way to mine it. However, 
when we took over this project, I think we had a better understanding, the team had a better understanding of the social and political landscape in Oregon, that this is going to be the first project that ever moves through Oregon's permitting regime. And that's not necessarily for the faint of heart. So you've probably heard all of us junior companies, we have something that makes us a little different. This is what makes us different. We are the test case for permitting in Oregon, um, which means that it's taking longer and, and costing more. And I'm going to have to dedicate an entire slide to explain <laughs> the permitting regime to you. Um, but, you know, I think, I think our assessment that uh, an open pit likely would not be able to get permitted, though a smaller footprint underground mine could. And we're very far into this process now. And as I mentioned, we're hoping to have a near-term um, permitting catalyst that will define that for the market, which has been missing up until this point. So Oregon um, is a pay-to-play state, which means that we have to reimburse these agencies for the work that they do in assessing our permits, which means that time literally costs money, um, but it also means that Paramount, as a small company that's capital constrained, this is why we've really been laser focused on grassy and nothing else. The economics are there, and it's something that we believe we can get over the line. So what they do have is this process that is, is largely time-based. And again, as I mentioned, we're the first ones going through the process. So Oregon doesn't have a history of rejecting mines. They just literally haven't had an opportunity to assess one and go through the process. So we're kind of all learning through it together. Um, so the key things to note here are when um, the DOGAMI, which is the Department of Geology and Mineral Industries in Oregon, when they receive our application, what's called a consolidated permit application, on their initial pass, they only have 90 days to respond. And that means coordinating amongst all the different agencies, Fish and Wildlife, DEQ, the whole gambit of them, to assess the application and say, hey, do we have everything we need here to make an informed decision on whether we can start writing draft permits or not? On the first pass, they're only given 90 days, which frankly is an unrealistically short period of time. So we made that first application submission in 2019. We're into our second application submission, which was, was put in last December. And now we're working collaboratively with the agencies as their process to, they, they work with us as the applicant to ensure that there's nothing missing from this application that would cause them to deny permits on some missing document that could have been easily provided. This part is a bit slow, and this is the one part in this entire process where there isn't a fixed timeline as the one that we're in now. However, given that we're lapping on about a year and a half of this back and forth and, and sort of methodically knocking back through all their comments, we do expect that in the coming months we will get this notice to proceed. And once that comes from the state, they, they start a 225-day clock on themselves where they have to issue draft permits and have completed the environmental assessment. So the other stuff that's happening behind the scenes is that the state and the BLM are going to coordinate their work on these environmental studies, and that's designed in a sense to help the state meet this 225-day timeline. So there is a lot happening in the background, even if it isn't things that we can publicly announce in a way that the market will say, oh, good, Oregon's actually open for business, because this has really been, I think, the single biggest reason why our stock is as inexpensive as it is. Once draft permits are received, then there's a 140-day period for the issuance of final permits. All along the way, there's opportunities for public consultation, which is also helpful because it's so important to have these communities engaged and different stakeholder groups engaged, particularly as we are the first mine that's going to be built in the state. So we have made a lot of progress since acquiring this project back in 2016 for $10 an ounce. Again, like I said, it's not the big one of the state permit, but there have been a lot of other significant permitting events that have happened in that period of time. Um, I'd mentioned that at Grassy we have opportunities for mine life extension. I would say there are both near mine um, exploration targets that we've already identified. There is a potential that there could be more higher grade at depth because frankly, um, while there's about 500 drill holes in total have gone into grassy, there's a limit that you're going to do from surface when you know you're gonna be thinking a decline. And certainly once we're thinking a decline to move into a production scenario, we'll have an opportunity to do more drilling at depth as well. But one of the other projects that we have, which we optioned is uh, Frost. This is 12 miles from grassy. It had been drilled back in the 90s by Western Mining. Um, they had hit assays then at about 25 grams per ton. Um, we have the benefit of understanding the geology 
at Grassy, seeing similar signatures here with the geophysics. Um, we put in a very moderate initial program in the fall of 2021. We had a little bit of, of interesting data that came back that I would say more informs for a future drill program. At this stage, however, without visibility on timing on permits, my appetite to invest more capital in drilling in Oregon right now is limited from a paramount standpoint, because really we need to show that we can get grassy permitted before we allocate more capital to a further exploration program at, at Frost. The other part of our story is the old sleeper property that we have in Nevada. So this was a former producer, quite a storied past. Uh, there was a large um, historic resource here. The production that historically came out of it was all out of that little yellow dot in the middle of this map. We have 40,000 acres here that are largely contiguous. We have not been able to do a lot of work at Sleeper, though we did have to upgrade the, um, the resource for SK-1300 standards. As we started to do that in MDA working with us, we did come across the somewhat unfortunate reality that a lot of the historic going back, you know, 30, 40 year data had never been digitized. So that ended up being a bit more of a time consuming effort than we'd initially anticipated. And so uh, right now we have on paper an inferred resource but look to that to increase to an unmeasured and indicated later this year, going back to some of the historic data that we had there. So, you know, the thing with Sleeper is there was a lot of historic drilling that was done all concentrated around the old pit, not surprisingly. It was a seven gram per 10 vein that they were milling it, mining out of. Um, you know, but there's a lot of blank space here. So, you know, certainly going forward, this is something that really could benefit from more attention than what we've been able to allocate to it in terms of capital in our current environment. And then lastly, we do have another small property in our, in our portfolio that we picked up, Bald Peak, which is also on the um, Bodhi Aurora Borealis trend. You heard Caleb talk about a little bit that, that area earlier. Um, this was a very, very cheap upfront option for us to exercise through our friends at Ely Gold, who we also option Frost from. And what attracted our geologists to this is that it is sitting on this parallel structure uh, to these former producing mines, um, and we had minimal spend to advance to a drill program. We do have permits here to drill, and uh, we have targets identified. We shot some geophysics, we did surface sampling, and um, we would love to get at this, but again, it will have to wait to make sure that we're in a position to be able to afford to do it properly. So it's not this year, then it will be next year, but it is something in the portfolio that we're pretty excited to get at when the time is right. And lastly, uh, I mentioned earlier that I only joined the company in February 23. The rest of the management team has actually been together for about 13 years from the first Paramount into this one. So there's some good continuity in terms of institutional knowledge and, and whatnot, and certainly project knowledge, which is important. I have a strong board. As I mentioned, Rudy Franck is our chairman. We have good geological support, good engineering support on our board as well. And lastly, this is us by the numbers. Um, Small market cap right now, definitely trading under the radar for a couple of reasons. I mean, we are probably one of the only U.S. only listed exploration companies or development companies out there. So we don't benefit from the Canadian landscape or some of the other indices out there that incorporate smaller cap names. Um, we have tried to keep the share count low. So that's been by design. We only have about 47 million shares out right now. Uh, on a basic basis, so that sees us trading, like I said, at single, down, at single digit ounces in the ground. We do have the benefit of research coverage from um, two US firms, but obviously we're always on the lookout to be bringing in more attention to the name, both from the buy and from the sell side. And that's our story. Thank you, Rachel. Do we have any questions for Rachel? And Paramount. Good question. Um, the cyanide usage, I mean, that is that is part of our current plan. Part of it is showing, uh, part of the work that we've done is to show the cyanide destruction. And essentially, we did a 
who did a great teach-in with a number of the uh, state legislators last fall explaining to them that basically your handful of almonds is going to have more cyanide in it than what's going to come out of the tailings at Grassy, which was which was effective. I mean, it was actually tremendous to have these people come through. I think we had 20% of the legislature of Oregon come through on an economic development tour of Eastern Oregon. They dedicated an entire day to learning about Paramount, what the opportunity is going to be for us to stimulate uh, the economy in that part of the state, which there aren't a whole lot of ways to do it. So yeah, cyanide is a is a focus area, but you know I think all the work that we've done has shown that that that's you know it's it's manageable and it's well below their their own targeted levels. Um, and what was the other part of that question? Oh, we're not far at all, but I think you know the the value proposition for the stakeholders, including lo local communities and the people who want the jobs, if we're moving it to Idaho, they're not going to benefit in the same way. So we haven't envisioned that. We're you know the plant will be on site. Um, certainly, sourcing people will come from different communities. You know the the closest town for us is Vail, which has a very small population, but. Ontario, Oregon, Mesa are slightly bigger, and obviously Boise is not far away. So, you know, there, there is definitely potential to bring people in from other areas. So I think, you know, the, the ideal would be to do the higher value processing in Oregon, just to win that, to make sure we ensure that support. Thank you, Rachel.